Good evening, my name is Kendall. Welcome again to all of you from all over the world to join us again on the second day of our AOY conference. I hope all of you are well and blessed. Um, before we begin, I'd like to make a few announcements. So number one, if you have any questions during the workshop, please feel free to type them down in the chat box below so we can get direct it to the speaker. Or you can email them to evelyn at aoyweb.org. Uh, Secondly, also if any testimonies or prayer requests that you are convicted or you feel like sharing with us, do post it on social media with the hashtag AOY2021online. Or you can email them to prayerteam at aoyweb.org. Last but not least, not forgetting this important announcement, we would like to encourage you to join our United Prayer. It starts um, at Malaysian time in the morning. There are two sessions. So the Chinese session is from 6.15 a.m. to 6.55 a.m. And the English session will last from 7 a.m. to 7.40 a.m. Malaysian time. So now, as many were blessed by the workshop yesterday, I hope our second workshop today by Dr. Pandit, entitled God, 
Fact or fiction will speak to our hearts even more as we learn how to study and compare different religions. So before we begin, let us have an opening prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, I'd like to um, surrender Dr. Pandit into your hands as you put your words in his mouth, speak through him, through your Holy Spirit, and may all of our hearts be touched, Lord, by what he's about to share. And I pray that you please protect all our devices, all our internet connection as well, that your message will go through. Be with us in Jesus' name we pray and ask, amen. So Dr. Pandit, the time is yours. Uh, just a sound check, can you hear me clearly? Loud and clear, Dr. Pandit. All right. Okay, here we go again. Good evening, everyone. Of course, here in the United States, it is morning. So if you are close by here, it is morning. Good morning. Um, nice to be with you again. You know, we got a bunch of uh, very good questions here from yesterday. So I'm going to address some of those. And the organizer said I could have a few minutes longer today. So if you don't mind, we will have a little longer session today. Uh, I need that time because some of the arguments and the expressions and the explanations do require a little time. So please bear with uh, me. Uh, tomorrow we'll, uh, we'll have a little more time for questions as well. It won't be that heavy as well. Not so much of philosophy and science and mathematics. Uh, but today it will be. But first, some of the questions. Here are some of the questions that came. So let's look at them. What are the arguments for or against Russell's teapot? Uh, Russell's teapot is the explanation that some people give to show that the theistic idea of God is not really reasonable because they say it's like uh, somebody saying there's a teapot circling up uh, in space <laughs> and nobody knows and nobody has seen the teapot. Uh, what's the point of saying there's a teapot up there? <laughs> uh, it's a good argument uh, as far as saying that it, it is beyond us or it is in another dimension, yes. But here's where the argument or the simile breaks down. If the teapot only was circling around the earth and that's all it was doing, well, then it's hard to say the whether there is a teapot or not. However, if we suddenly find some drops of tea in our hand or on our clothes, then we can make a reasonable deduction that there might be a teapot out there. So that part in which some evidence has come down to us that is what is missing in Russell's teapot argument. We do have, if you look very carefully, go back and see the pan process we did, arguments for and against, remember we did both sides. We find that there are arguments for pointing to the uh, claim that there is a God. There are arguments, in fact, they are very strong arguments. So Russell's teapot is not totally a teapot only in, in space, but it is giving us some indications here that there might be a teapot. That's what we said would be the weight of evidence. So if there's evidence, we must accept it. If we are having those four uh, factors, remember, humility, honesty, calmness, and respect. So the next question, how does evil, pain, and suffering prove the existence of God? Can you explain it again? It does not prove the existence of God. We are just using that argument which already has been said. And here's the argument. If there is pain and suffering, then there is no God. That's the argument. Because a loving God cannot give so much of pain and suffering. That is the argument. So when we take that argument... We say we don't only suffer. Remember, pan, you must go across. Pan process goes across. So you must not only look at the pain and suffering. We also have joys and pleasures. So if the pain and suffering point to non-existence of God because of the contradiction between his love and pain and suffering, then joys and pleasures 
should point to the existence of God because of the harmony between his love and the presence of joys and pleasures. So when you look at both sides, they actually cancel out. So there's no point uh, that is made on the side of pain and suffering. And then the last point we made yesterday was if both evidence for presence as well as evidence for absence of any entity are found in the same place, then that entity is present. So both are found. Pain and suffering, which means no God. Uh, joys and pleasures, which according to this argument means that there is God. If both are there, well, then God is present. So that was the argument. By itself, there is no argument. But if you start the argument by saying that the presence of pain and suffering means that there is no God, then it will logically come to this conclusion. So by itself, no. But based on that argument, yes, it does come to that point. So we are not proving, we are just showing that the argument that was made will point to this side. The next one, doesn't the same argument apply to other straw man debates, i.e. do unicorns exist? It does in one sense. But here's the difference. When you say unicorns exist or don't exist, we are assuming unicorns don't exist. But we really don't know. Why is there the question of unicorns? What if somebody really saw a unicorn long, long ago and then wrote it out? So in one sense, we are assuming unicorns don't exist. But if you stop that assumption and just take it for granted, then we have to say that we don't know. We don't know whether you know, unicorns exist or don't exist. And that is the point when we deal with God. We don't know of our own selves because we live in a three-dimensional world. The fourth is time. But we agree, and it is the claim that God exists in the other dimensions. By the way, science and its mathematics do point to a fourth dimension of space. Did you know that? Yes. Fourth dimension of space. We have absolutely no idea what that means because we live in a three-dimensional world, space. Three dimension of space. So if there is a fourth dimension of space, we will not know anything unless whatever is in the fourth dimension somehow gives us some idea that is what we looked for in the pan process. And there is a, an evidence that comes down to us. And if we are honest, open inquirers, well, it is there. Uh, why do people believe, believe that there is no God when life itself is given by God? Now, that's a, the statement life is given by God is a belief. So a belief can be either correct or it can be wrong as well. So just to say God gave life doesn't settle the issue. You have to figure out whether God exists at all. And that's what we did yesterday. And we went through quite a process. We said we have to weigh the evidence, both sides. There is a God, there is no God. And when we did it, using honesty and humility, calmness and respect, we found that the weight of evidence is on the side of God. Um, so the, the statement there is no God or there is God and he gave us life is a belief. You can say it if you believe it. and But you have to agree that a belief can be right or can be also wrong. What we are saying is that when you discuss this out, you must discuss, discuss it fully so that you look at both sides equally and then weigh out the evidence. And when we did that yesterday, it seems to point to the evidence that there is a God. Uh, if persons don't believe in the Bible, why do we need to make an argument or discussion? Is there a practical approach? Now, this is a really good question because we haven't settled where we got the idea. We thought it was from the Bible, but that's exactly what we did yesterday. 
we did not appeal to anything in the Bible. We appealed only to science, reason, logic, evidence, reason, logic, and that's it. Why? Because there are many people out there who don't believe in the Bible. So I cannot use the Bible to prove that there is a God. I cannot even tell them it's written in the Bible, therefore you should believe. First, we should check whether there is a God outside the evidence found in the Bible. And then what we are going to do today, is the Bible a reliable piece of literature? And we're going to do that today. So uh, hold on, we will go through that question today about the Bible. Um, next question, does the Bible say the chicken came first or the egg came first? <laughs> That's another good question, but the Bible itself doesn't use the word chicken and egg. It does say there is a first cause. And the first cause is uncaused, and that cause is called God. He belongs to the other dimension, maybe the fourth dimension of space. That's where he lives. And from there, he looks into the three dimensions in which we live, and he does things. And he has also given us some evidence that there is a fourth dimension. Like I said, mathematics and science do point to a fourth dimension of space. So the chicken is not a chicken. The chicken is really God. Um, the next one, the principle of the first cause, or actually just carrying on the previous question, the principle of the first cause being causeless is often claimed by theists. That means the believers. Not really. Every belief system, including atheism, must go to an ultimate point which is causeless. What is the scientific beginning of the earth or the universe? Big Bang. What started the Big Bang? It's a point. It's a dimensionless point. It's called singularity. So the question then is, where did singularity come from? And immediately the question is causeless by itself, no cause. So every idea drawn to at its ultimate conclusion will have to come to that same confession. The first point is causeless, not just the believers who say that. Everyone says that. Or you'll have to say, I don't know. And which is the truth, we don't know. But we will believe and the belief should be resting on some form of evidence. And the believers have some form of evidence to say that that first cause, uncaused cause is and can be called God. Next one, what is the difference between the Big Bang and the first causeless cause, God being the first causeless cause? Actually, they are kind of the same. Do you know the persons who really were given the Nobel Prize for looking at the cosmic uh, background radiation? They found that, and so it proved the Big Bang. You know what they themselves said? This, if you look at it very carefully, the universe began with a point and a bang and a flash. And so those persons who's, who got the Nobel Prize for that they say, actually, that description kind of fits the, the description of the creation of God in the first day. Bang, light. Well, in one sense, it is the same. The argument could be made that God did it that way. But the argument of the Big Bang is that there was no God at all. It happened by itself. And once again, it can't be by itself because there's an absurd argument. There is no argument. If, an, if it is absurd, there is no argument. And therefore, the Big Bang could be taken as way, well the way it happened, but the fundamental difference is it didn't happen by itself. It happened because there was a causeless first cause. And that cause had to have a mind because we have minds. If we go back and ask where we got our minds, there has to be a source. So that God is not just a power. It has to have a personality. That's why you use the word God. Uh, the next one is, um, 
I've always thought that one of the weak points in the arguments for the Big Bang theory is that nothing made something. Is this thinking correct? If not, does the same weakness not also apply to the theistic world view that nothing made something? No, it does not apply to the theistic world view because nothing did not make something in the theistic world view. God as the causeless first cause did it. He did not have a cause. Remember, we have to have the final point as causeless. So the theistic belief is that the causeless cause is God. The atheistic belief is that the ultimate point of starting is really absolute nothingness. And we saw that it is physically, philosophically, mathematically absurd. And absurdity is not an explanation. It is something that we agreed in the beginning that we would not use. So we have addressed uh, most of these. If you have any uh, some things that needed a little more clarification, let's uh, go ahead and uh, write them down and we will address, like I said, I hope we will be able to address almost all of them. We've eaten into our time today, so let's carry on with what we really have. Let me share the screen here. Um, sorry, I need to open. That is just a moment. All right, here we go. We're going to come to the point where we come to this second one I'm sorry I thought I had opened it here we go so the second session we're starting uh, we're going to do three things today pluralism which says all the religions are actually the same and then we're going to look at the type of literature and the authenticity and here we're going to look at uh, the Bible and all the other writings as well. So we'll go a little faster because we don't have time. Uh, but uh, listen carefully. Pluralism. It says actually all religions lead to God. They are different paths but end up at the same final destination. So why do you want to be so keen about your own religion? All religions lead to God. Here's a statement by W.E. Hawk. God is in the world but Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad are in their little closets and we should thank them but never return to them. A Zen, Zen is the mystic form of Buddhism. It says to understand God is to listen. Listen to Jesus, Muhammad and Buddha but don't get caught up in the names. Listen beyond them. Listen to God's breath. It sounds good but here's the problem. If you listen to God's breath. In, in other words, if you listen to Muhammad and Jesus and Buddha, then you cannot listen beyond them because each of them is saying, don't listen beyond me. So we are, we are, we are caught now. If you're going to listen to them, they are saying, don't listen beyond. So should we listen beyond or to? Zen saying, he says you can do both, but you cannot do both because if you listen to them, they are saying, don't listen beyond. So pluralism recognizes not only the existence of other religions, but their intrinsic equal values. They are not only valid and true, but equally so. So when I looked at the writings, and I wish we had a little time to look at the writings themselves, but take it from me. And if you have a question, I will show it to you. I did not find a single religion or a belief system that claimed the others to be equal alternatives. Every religion and belief system claims itself to be the only way. I didn't find any. If you have any, you can show it and we will look at those. Not only did they claim to be the only way, they also claimed that the others are wrong. And that also has its uh, statements in the writings. 
So pluralism does not appear to be an established idea when writings are examined. It is an opinion by people. It is not in the writings at all. But every right, every religion claims to be the only way. So now we have multiple claims, each of them saying that they are the only way. How shall we approach that? Logically, we have three options. Number one, all are correct. That is absurd. If you say you're the only way and the other person also says the only way, both cannot be right. All are wrong. That's a bit hard because we do not have the position and the knowledge and the authority to say that anyone is wrong. You can't go up to Muhammad and say, Muhammad, you're wrong. Or go up to Buddha and say, you're wrong. Or to Jesus and say, you're wrong. We cannot do that. We have no authority. So we can't call all of them correct. We can't call all of them wrong. We have only one option left then. There's only one legitimate that is correct in its claim of being the only way. Think. It's a crucial, amazing, pivotal conclusion. There's one and only one religion that can make a legitimate claim of being the only way. So we're going to look for that way. That's the next natural question. How do we identify the way? We can't compare the doctrines. We cannot compare the beliefs. Why? Because we do not have an accepted reference point to use as a standard. You must have a reference point, a standard, and then bring the beliefs. But we don't have a reference point by which you can compare the beliefs with the standard. So we look to the stories. Every belief system on earth came from the other realm through a story. So the beliefs and doctrines came out of the stories. So what I did was looked at the stories and I called it the para-religious factors. And I chose 10 of them. And here they are 10. You can read them. We're going to do only six of them during the next three days, today, tomorrow, and day after. These are the things we're going to do. The first two we'll do today. What is the type of literature? Does it allow test for authenticity? And then we'll go down the list, but we'll do only six of the 10 for lack of time. Let's take a break. If you have any questions, write them down and send them in. And we will look at them. All right, let's go on to the question of literature. Here's the question. What type of literature is that writing from that particular religion? Now, ancient literature is classified into basically four. Folktale, folklore, legend, myth, and the fourth is historical. One look at that will tell you that the historical is the most reliable, right? But what are those four? Folktale, there's no attempt to state a real true story. They will tell the, you know, the wind is whispering, the sun is smiling, all the birds and the animals will meet for a committee meeting. They know it's false, but they are stating that as a story to may give a lesson or a moral. So a folk tale is not considered a true story by itself. A legend, probably based on a real true story, but changes. See, I've underlined the word changes. Changes creep in over time. Exaggerations to make the story into superhuman proportions. The changes begin generations after the event. You cannot make a legend in the same generation. We use the word legend very loosely. We say he's a football legend or a, or a basketball legend or a cricket legend, but uh, legends, when we use the word that way, we mean they're really good, not a legend. A legend is when something happens that is ordinary and changes. See the word changes? Changes come into the story and make it into superhuman. That's a legend and it takes a long time. Actually, it takes centuries to form a legend. Myth is so far back in history that it's generally accepted as somebody's imagination. But it may not be. It might be true, but it's extremely difficult to establish it. And so we call it a myth. It usually involves the supernatural world of gods and goddesses. And the time period to form a myth is actually many, many centuries and even millennia, thousands of years. Historical, 
Here's the attempt to state the story as it really was. No significant additions, no core changes. By the way, all ancient writings have changes. So don't say that this one has no change at all. It does. The question is, does it change the actual story or is it a peripheral change? That's the point. And the closer to the event, the, uh, the writing, the more credible it is. So on the bottom of the screen of these letters, EV is the event. Whenever there's an unusual event, the community makes it, used to make it into a story and they passed it on from generation to generation. That uh, by word of mouth. So it was called the oral tradition. From the event, it became an oral tradition. From the oral tradition, it became WT written tradition. After many generations, they wrote it down. And then we do not have the original manuscripts of any of these writings. So we look for what is called the earliest manuscript. And those dashes in between are the gaps. If the gaps are really long, then the credibility goes down. If the gaps are very short, then the credibility goes up. So with these words, let's look at the writings. In Hinduism, the Rig Veda is the earliest and the youngest, the Mahabharata, in which is found the Bhagavad Gita, where, which people often quote for Hinduism. But look at the words regarding the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord Krishna, first spoke Bhagavad Gita to the sun god some hundreds of millions of years ago. Now that is just too far for us to go and check. And that's why uh, it says in the ultimate encyclopedia of mythology that Krishna, according to Hindu mythology, is an avatar or an incarnate of Vishnu, God Vishnu, the preserver of the universe. Krishna is the eighth incarnate. So the word mythology is there. So basically the stories of Hindu writings are accepted as mythological. In Buddhism, I want you to see these four statements and watch what happens. Statement one, the humanity of the Buddha is expressed by a Theravada monk. Who is a Theravada monk? Uh, he was the one who lived at the time when Gautama Buddha was on this earth. And he said this, was he, Buddha, not born at Lumbidi, did he not complete existence at Kusinara, in other words? This Theravada monk says, Gautama Buddha was born here and he died here. That's the picture. Now watch what happens. Stent sentence number two, soon after the passing of the master, a change began to set in. Remember we had underlined the word change. Number three, at the beginning of the Christian era, 500 years have gone by now. The transcendental nature of the Buddha became more and more pronounced. Statement four, in one of the most important pieces of Mahayana literature, the earlier form of Buddhism is called Hinayana. The later form is called Mahayana. Mahayana means big vehicle. There's not much of the man left in the Buddha. He is now an exalted being who has lived for countless ages in the past and, in, and will continue to live forever. In other words, the first statement about Gautama Buddha is he was born here and he died here. 700 to 1000 years later, no, he was, not, he, didn't, he was not born here. He always lived. He didn't die here. He will live forever. The change when such straight, uh, straightforward change can be demonstrated, we have to call it a legend. Judaism, I did not uh, classify it. You, you can try it and that's fair enough. And look at all the uh, features that you find there. In this study, I did not classify it. Islam, the Quran was put together in writing by 652 CE, common era, same as AD, within 20 years of Muhammad's life. The writing was confined to one generation but Muhammad did not write it. Many people think Muhammad wrote the Quran. He did not. That's why they call it the Quran. The Quran means the recitation. He only recited it. He didn't write it down. And he is the only one in Islamic tradition who was an inspired individual. Allah inspired him. So who wrote it then? Uninspired people. Not only that, it was compiled twice, put together. And after the second time, all the manuscripts were ordered, destroyed by the third caliph, whose name was Uthman. So we cannot really vouch for what is there now because the fragments of the uh, manuscripts are destroyed. We cannot go back and say this is exactly what was there. It's always a question then. 
Christianity, the earliest manuscript is about 114 to 134 AD. The original manuscripts were within 20 to 50 years of the life of Jesus, confined to one generation and no core changes. Small changes, yes, but no core changes. But the earliest writing actually, Eliezer Sukenik, professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, found two ossuaries, these pots where they put the dead men's bones and then buried them. That's the honorable way of burying people in those days. On, on these two ossuaries are found the earliest known Christian writing. They are dated about 41 AD, within 10 years, the life of Jesus. One of them reads, it was etched onto that ossuary, Jesus God. And the other, Jesus ascended one. These are the earliest Christian writings. So take note. It took 700 to 1,000 years to change Buddha, Siddhartha was his name, to become a godlike being. Here in 10 years, we go through the whole spectrum of event to oral tradition to written tradition, not just earliest manuscript. This is actually the original writing in 10 years, which historians say is actually no gap. And all the while, no change because the first writing places him as God. Did you say wow to that? I hope you did, because if you're honest, you'll have to say wow. I'm going to now quote three archeologists, the three of the greatest archeologists we've ever had. Number one is William Albright. So William Albright, an American archeologist, he says, we already can say emphatically that there's no longer any solid basis for dating any book of the New Testament after about AD 80, except maybe the book of Revelation. Nelson Gluck, is a Jewish archeologist. His statement is profound. It may be stated categorically that no archeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. The third archeologist is Sir William Ramsey, a British archeologist. And this is what he says. Luke's history is unsurpassed in respect of its trustworthiness. This author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians, not religious historians, very greatest of all historians. You put them all together. How did he come to that? After 30 years of comparing his archeological findings with Luke's writing. And remember Luke wrote two books in the New Testament. One is the gospel of Luke and the other is the book of Acts, which is a historical record of the early Christian church. Norman Geisler, a scholar, says in all, Luke names 32 countries, 54 cities, nine islands without a single error. Very difficult when you're doing a legendary piece of work to find this kind of accuracy. Now, so we acknowledge that actually the New Testament appears to be really quite historical. So we will compare now the New Testament with other works that are accepted as historical. And when you compare historical pieces, three factors are used to evaluate the credibility and reliability of the text itself. Number one, the time gaps, we saw that. Number two, the number of manuscripts. Why do we look at the number of manuscripts? Because if there are very few, we can go to each of them and change them. And nobody knows we've changed them because one night we did it here, there, and in my house and the shop there where the manuscripts are kept. And nobody knows we changed them. But if nobody knows, then we've corrupted the text. Whereas if there's lots of them, 50, 70 of them here, there, and everywhere, you can't in one night and quickly go and change all of them. And so when the number of manuscripts is large and spread out, we acknowledge that it's a pointer to the reliability of the text. In other words, nobody changed the text. And number three, where were the authors relating to the story? Were they close by the story on the next continent? Or maybe separated by generations? These three points we will look at just now, looking at three Roman authors, Caesar's Gaelic Wars. Herodotus history and Tacitus annual. Now look at one of the gaps in Caesar's Gaelic Wars. It was written in 100 BC. The earliest manuscript we have is 900 AD, a gap of 1000 years. What's the meaning of the gap? It means that during that 1000 years, nobody can vouch whether any of the stuff was taken out or added or modified. And yet we call it historical. 
Herodotus history, the gap is 1,300 years. Tacitus Annals, again, 1,000 years. And yet we acknowledge that these historians are writing actual solid history. Now look at the gap then with the New Testament, just 20 to 50 years. And actually we saw that the earliest writing is within 10 years. In a historian's mind, it is no gap at all. Look at the difference. Did you say, wow? The second one is the number of manuscripts. Caesar's Gallic War is backed by 10 manuscripts. Herodotus history by eight. Tacitus Annals by 20. The top of Greek literature is Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad is backed by 643 manuscripts. Now that's a big number compared to eight and 10 and 20. So in one sense, your eyes should open wide and say, whoa, 643, yes. What if I tell you that the New Testament is backed by 686? They have to say, wow, but really it is backed by 5,686 Greek manuscripts, just Greek. If you add the Arabic and the Armenian and the Latin and all the other languages, do you know how many manuscripts back the New Testament? 24,900. Did you say, wow? Were you honest? When the evidence comes, we must say, wow. 24,900 manuscripts. Compare that to the eight and 10 of these writings which we acknowledge are historical. How about where the authors were? Yes, Peter. We did not follow fables, but were eyewitnesses. John, he writes, from that hour, that disciple took her, Mary, home. Who is John? He's that disciple. He's writing about himself. And Acts, Luke wrote book of Acts. We sailed, we came. Where were these authors? Were they close to the story? Not just close, they were inside the story. They were part of the story they were writing. And friends, you cannot get closer than being inside. Where were these authors? Right there. Do you know the... New Testament is the only ancient writing in which the whole writing or the, for example, the Gospels written by eyewitnesses. There is no other writing of this nature anywhere else in the world written by eyewitnesses who can say, I really saw it and I was there. No other ancient book has anything like such early and plentiful testimony to its text and no unbiased scholar would deny that the text that has come down to us is substantially sound. Number two, in the variety and fullness of the evidence on which it rests, the text of the New Testament stands absolutely unapproachably alone among ancient prose writings. To be skeptical, by the way, this sentence, unapproachably alone among ancient prose writings, it's not just ancient prose writings or religious writings, all writings, starting with the unstructured Mayans and Sumerians and going on to the Babylonian, the Assyrians, the Indian, the Chinese, the Greek, the Roman, put all the writings together flat on the same table, the New Testament will rise up as the best attested historical piece of literature in all of the ancient world. To be skeptical then of the resultant text of the New Testament books is to allow all of the classical antiquity to slip into obscurity for no document of the ancient period are as well attested bibliographically as the New Testament. For example, then if you want to discard the New Testament, then on that standard, we will have to discard all of classical antiquity. We can't talk about the pharaohs, Chinese dynasties, Babylon, Cyrus the Great, Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, Caesar Julius Caesar, everyone goes out and we have to question all of the writings about them. So it is this that is the gold standard. This is the place where you come to where, which it is really historical. I know people say, you know, that it's just a religious writing. But when you look at the features and test them out, this is the best ancient writing that is historical compared to any other ancient writing. So while the Quran and the New Testament are historical in nature, according to the criteria that we applied, the New Testament clearly has the highest credibility and integrity of text. So let's take a break. 
And we do have, um, this will take about 10 to 15 minutes. Do we have time for that? I'm asking the organizers. Or we can close here and I can continue tomorrow on this topic. Uh, can anyone answer me? Shall we go ahead and do this as well? We still have time, Dr. Pandit, around 20 minutes. Shall we continue then finish it? Yes. Okay, very well. The second question, the first question was, what is the type of writing? And we saw that the New Testament is a historical, the most reliable. Second, is it authentic? Here's the question. Does the writing and literature contain and describe a test that an inquirer could use to determine its authenticity, meaning evident that the message came from to the human race from a source that could be classed as supernatural in nature and quality? So the question is, how do we know whether there's any test written in the writings? In Hinduism, we have to accept it as it is. Otherwise, there's no point in trying to understand the Bhagavad Gita and its speaker, Lord Krishna. Hinduism says there's no test. You have to just accept it. Same with Buddhism. Absolute truth is unconditional, undeterminate, and beyond thought and word. You can't test it. In other words, both Hinduism and Buddhism say there's no test in the writings. They do say there's a test. And that's in your experience. And I think that's a good test. They say experience it. And when you experience it, you will see how wonderful and great and, and reliable it is. The only problem with that test is that all the religions say that that is a test. So if all the religions say that that is one test, then it's not a real test because all of them are saying the same thing. Suppose you ask me to choose a tree and put 10 trees in front of me. And I say, well, I want that tree that has green leaves. All of the trees have green leaves. So which tree am I choosing? In other words, when you make a test, it has to be something different not what everyone is saying. When it comes to Islam, there is a test. It says, produce one chapter comparable to it. Call upon your idols to assist you if what you say is true, but if you fail, as you are sure to fail. In other words, you cannot write uh, writings as comparable as to the Quran. In other words, if men and jinn, jinn are creatures between humans and angels. If men and jinn combine to produce a book akin to this Quran, they would surely fail to produce its like. Not only the book, but even cha 10 chapters. And Surah 10 and Ayah 38 says not even one chapter. So it really is a test. I wanted to test it out. But four things block the test. Here are the four. What aspect to be equaled? If you ask me to equal so-and-so, the first question I'll say, how shall I equal him in height or strength or clothes or complexion or grades or physical strength? Tell me what point to equal. If you don't tell me, it's not really a test. It doesn't tell us what aspect to be equal. Number two, it doesn't tell us the method of comparison. Will it be subjective or objective? Objective means, okay, so this one got so many marks and this one got so many marks, 15, 25, so 25 wins. Or is it, I just like this. It doesn't say how to test it. What is a method of comparison? Who will be the judge is the third question that blocked it. Now they don't say who is the judge. So by default, then the person who's doing the test becomes the judge. And if that's the case, if I am doing the test, then I am the judge. And if that happens, really, the case is over. Because I have found writing that equals and even is better than the Quran. Even Arabic writers, Khalil Gibran, Omar Khayyam, Jalal Uddin Rumi, beautiful writings. Nobody can say they're really worse. They're at least equal. In fact, some of the Shia Muslims agree with what I've said, that we can find writing that are equal if not better than the Quran. So that uh, is a question. Number four, what language? You can only do this test if you know Arabic because Arabic is the only language authorized by Allah. Because the Quran came down from a mother book in heaven, which is written in Arabic. So if you want to do this test and equal it, you have to do it in Arabic and not the ordinary Arabic. The Quranic Arabic is very specific. It is very literary. 
it has a very not just the words it's the rhythm and that's the message there so how many people know that kind of arabic less than 1% of earth's population knows that arabic so more than 99% of earth's population does not know that arabic so they cannot do the test so when you look at all these four it is not really a test it's a statement and sounds good but when you try to do the test it just blocks so when we are blocked at doing the test we can't really call it an authentic test when we come to the judeo christian scriptures that put these two together and you'll see why i am going to read a statement by a person called pierre simon laplace he's a french a uh, scientist a great scientist in fact when i was doing my medical studies a few years ago we had to learn laplace's laws now he lived way back when isaac newton lived in fact he was known as the sir isaac newton of france he was a strong powerful atheist newton was a believer pierre laplace was a confirmed hard-nosed atheist he enunciated what is a statement i'm going to read now called scientific determinism in that statement he uses the word intellect unusually because atheists don't agree that there is any intellect other than human intellect in our sphere of existence and in the other sphere there's first of all no other sphere so there's no other intellect but yet he uses the word intellect i'm going to read the whole statement and tell you what it says here's a statement we may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future an intellect which at a certain moment would know all the forces that set nature in motion and all positions of all items of which nature is composed if this intellect were also vast enough to submit these data for analysis it would embrace in a single formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom for such an intellect nothing would be uncertain in the future just like the past would be present before its eyes so he's describing an intellect if the intellect sat here how will we check whether this person is the intellect suppose i say i am that intellect how will you check me out because i am the intellect i know everything you speak in english i'll speak in german or sanskrit because i am an intellect i know everything you can't test me by just directly asking me and just getting the answer right there but there might be a way in which we can test this intellect we can ask him for example what will happen tomorrow also what will happen next week what will happen next month what will happen next year and what will happen after 10 years and if all five of them come true then we might have identified that intellect because the intellect knows every property of all the items of all the atoms for example this is a pointer this intellect then would know every atom in this pointer and every property and uh, and feature of every atom and also all the laws that govern every uh, atom in this pointer so with that information he can look back 100 years and say where every atom was 100 years ago because he knows everything about the atoms he can also look forward 100 200 years and he will tell us exactly where every atom wa- will be because he knows everything about the atoms and all the laws governing them and so bef- this to this at- intellect nothing would be answered he can tell the future so if we if he really predicts exactly what will happen 5 years 10 years 20 years from now and all of them come true we have identified the intellect and that's exactly the test of the judeo christian scriptures present your case says the lord let them bring forth and show us what will happen declare to us things to come show us the things that will come here after that we may know that you are that intellect isaiah uses the word god we can put the word intellect So what is this called it's called predictive prophecy can you say it before it happens now there's a book it's called what is atheism and a short introduction by Douglas Kruger who says there are five points which it must 
meet before it's called a genuine prophecy. Number one, it should be clear with enough detail. Number two, it should be unusual, not an everyday occurrence. Number three, it should be made prior to the event that is uh, reasonable, logical. Number four, it should not be an educated guess. You don't look at trends like in stock market and make a prediction. That's not a real prophecy. Number five, it should not be staged or manipulated. And then he goes on to say, there's not a single prophecy that meets all five. But really, let's look at one of them. Let's look at what I, uh, Jeremiah said. In Jeremiah 51, 36, he says, I will make her springs dry. Who is her? It is the city of Babylon. In the next verse, he says, Babylon shall become a heap without an inhabitant. This was written in about 595 BCE, uh, before the common era, same as BC. At that time, Babylon was the strongest, most fortified city in the world. Today, our walls are about maybe 18 inches, 24 inches thick, the big ones, the big, uh, the, the big buildings. Do you know how thick the walls of Babylon were? We can go, actually, the ruins are there. We can still measure it out. It was a double wall. Do you know the thickness? 87 feet thick at its base. How are you going to beat up that wall? How high did the walls go? Our walls go 20, 30, 40, 50 feet. The walls of Babylon went up 175 to 300 feet. How do you climb over that wall to beat that city? You'll have to have a long ladder. And if you have to get a ladder, you have to bring it close to the wall. You can't get close to the wall because the wall was surrounded by a moat, a ditch filled with water. And those who have studied it, they tell us that the volume of that moat was the same as the volume of the wall, a huge moat. You couldn't come anywhere near it. So how do you defeat a city like that? And yet it says it will become a heap. Well, you can lay siege. But you have to lay siege. You have to place your soldiers at the gate. Don't let anyone come in or go out because your food is outside and they have to bring it in. And if you can't bring it in for a period of time, then your stores will go out and you will starve and then you'll uh, give up <laughs> bring come with a red uh, white flag give up <laughs> that's how you lay a siege but you can't lay a siege indefinitely you can't go on for one two three years go on and on because all you're doing is paying your soldiers for doing nothing except looking at the gate so sieges don't go on very very long why do why did the inhabitants of Babylon laugh at anyone who wanted to lay siege to Babylon because inside Babylon, in its storehouses, there was enough food for everyone for a period of 20 years. How are you going to beat that city? It fell. And here's how it fell. Herodotus wrote it out. He said uh, Cyrus was winning his wars and he came to Babylon. He said, if I get Babylon, I'll be world emperor. So he wanted Babylon around it and see how shall we defeat the city. Babylon is situated on the river Euphrates. The river Euphrates runs one end and comes out the other of Babylon. Now when Cyrus was going around looking for a way to defeat the city, scouting around, his horse on which he was riding died in one of the tributaries of, of Euphrates. He got angry with the river. He said, this river killed my horse. And he called his generals and he said, I want this river dry. And the generals looked at each other and said, okay, you want it. And so they call all their soldiers and Herodotus in writing history says that they dug from 80 to 300 aqueducts or little canals paralleling the river and drained it dry. When they drained it dry or nearly dry, Cyrus saw his way into the city on the river bed. And Babylon fell in one night without a single drop of bloodshed. It just came in and the people accepted him as king. And then the whole city gradually deteriorated. And today, few words evoke as many images of ancient decadence, glory and prophetic doom as does Babylon. And yet the actual place 50 miles south of Baghdad is flat, hot, the next word, deserted. Think, this is written in 2003. It's still the same today. So 2,500 years ago, it was written that it would be a heap without an inhabitant. 2,500 years later, it still is a heap without an inhabitant. 
is it a prophecy come true you decide and you don't have to believe what we are saying if you have a little money buy a plane ticket to baghdad you can get there you can see the ruins today nobody lives there how many of these kind of prophecies will impress you when i was doing this i said man 10 or 12 i'll be happy because it's so unusual scholars report they have identified 600 prophecies in the judeo christian scriptures 322 of them refer to a single individual jesus the christ the anointed one the messiah 24 of them were fulfilled in just one weekend i was asked for 10 or 12 24 in one weekend how about some statistics uh, and i know some of us are not mathematically minded but but here are the statistics peter stoder considers just 48 not 322 48 reports and he finds that any one man to fulfill we would require 10 to the power of 157 chances 10 to the power of 157 means one followed by 157 zeros that many chances statistically you must give so that at one point one person will fulfill 48 prophecies now the total number of chances of the entire universe since the big bang is only 122 rather 10 to the power of 122 so if the total number of chances provided by the entire universe since its inception according to the standard model the big bang model is 10 to the power of 122 and the number of chances required to fulfill these only 48 is 10 to the power of 157 then can you see how much we need to give just one chance by itself for this to occur it would require a series of 10 to the power of 35 consecutive universes not just worlds universes 15 billion years each that many can you see how many zeros there are 35 zeros i, I wrote down that many universes consecutive 15 billion years each so that at some point you get one person who will do this so what do we say it is statistically utterly impossible for it to have happened by chance so we have to agree that if it happened it didn't happen by chance it happened because there was an intellect who could see in the future and tell and write it down now here are two statements one by pierre simon laplace and another by a respected believer and look at the the similarity i have highlighted the words for such an intellect nothing would be uncertain in the future just like the past would be present before its eyes look at those five words which are also found in the next statement written by a believer and some people call her a prophetess he that ruleth in the heavens is the same as the intellect he sees eyes the end from the beginning the one before whom the mysteries of the past past and the future future are alike like exactly the same statement from an atheist and from a believer so concurring concurring data from multiple sources should give us a sense of what we are dealing with and honestly give it some credit here's a brilliant atheist and a respected believer saying something that we can find in ancient writings and it is verifiable by secular history we must give credit where it is due so the judeo christian scriptures act is new testament is the best attested historical literature least gaps in time greatest manuscript evidence and authors were part of the story and is the only writing that permits an open test for possible divine origin go where the argument leads now i'm sorry we don't have time for questions but please write them down and we will deal with it because tomorrow we won't have such a long presentation we will we will have time for questions so that's what we are dealt with today all religions are not the same when we look at the writings the new testament historical and it also contains a test for possible divine origin it's a powerful uh, evidence of uh, reliability thank you well thank you dr pandit for um such an incredible presentation actually um they've decided to extend uh 10 more minutes for questions so would you like to do that 
Maybe yes, if there are questions. Yes. Um, there are two questions actually that we've received. Um, one question was, what do you mean by the four factors that block the test for Quran? What do you mean by the single out and also the judge? Uh, just one question at a time. All right. Last okay. one. Yeah, I'm sorry. What do you mean by the four factors that block the test for Quran? You see, when you say that this is a test, the test should be able to be done. You can't say I'm doing the test, for example. You can't say um, you're in Malaysia, for example. You can't say, uh, please do the test in the United States. And you can't even get there. So that'll block the test. So any factor in which it stops you from doing the test actually and, re and, and reliably, that's a block of the test. And if the test is blocked, it is not a test. So we saw those four which blocks the test. It doesn't say which aspect to be equaled. So for example, I said, if you ask me to equal so-and-so, another person, I will say, what do you want me to equal? In height, complexion, strength, grades in school, or how fast you can run, tell me what is the aspect. If you don't tell me what the aspect is, first of all, it's not a test. Secondly, you're allowing me to do any test and I can defeat the, 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 the one that is we are testing. So no, you have to tell exactly what it is. And also tell how you're going to measure. Will it be in pounds? Or will it be in inches? Or will it be in volume? What is the method you're going to use? If you don't tell the method, it's not a test. And then who will be the judge? Like I said, if you actually want to do a test in the Olympics, you have judges. Only then you can say this runner came first. Or this one did the high jump the best. Without judges, you cannot have a test. And when there's no judge mentioned, then the default judge is the person who's doing the test. And if that's the case, and like I said, it's over because some Shia Muslims also say it can be equal. The Quran can be equaled. And like we said, the last one is Arabic. If you don't know Arabic, you can't do the test. 99% of the world's population cannot do the test. It's like saying go to America to do the test. It blocks the test. And if a test is blocked, it is not a test. What's the second question of that? Um, another question. I think you explained the judge. Um, a little but louder. I can't can hear you. Hear can you hear me? No, I can't still hear you. Now, can you hear me? Yes, yes. All right, so sorry. Um, just now you mentioned about the judge, but um, the person asked as well about what do you mean by sing single out, singling out? Say it again, I didn't get the question. What do you mean by? Sing the single out. I didn't get the question. What do I mean by? The single out. I think taking it out, isolating it, the single out. Do you out. know what, what was the reference? It's, it's also talking about the four factors that you've mentioned that block the Quran, to test the Quran. Yes. Yeah, how to single out. I think that that was what she meant. But do clarify um, for the person who asked the question, do correct me if I understood it wrongly. I have not really understood the question. Yeah, she. I'll clarify with the person first. Is that okay? okay? You can clarify it and get back with me. Is there any yeah. other question? Um, there's one more question. Okay. Uh, my students ask, is Galaxy and the Milky Way created by God and how did he create it? She just knew about Christianity. Uh, can you once again go just a little slower? All right. I, I so need sorry. To get all the words. Yes. All right. My students ask, is the Galaxy and the Milky just, Way. Just one moment. I didn't get the first words. My what? Students. Okay. Students asked, is the Galaxy. And the yes. Milky Way. And the, which word? No, no, no. Galaxy and the next word? Milky Way. 
Milky Way, okay. Created by God. Yes. And how did he created it? Uh, we are asking for some details. Um, I think humans. the person wanted to know how to explain to the students. Yes. Humans, we are limited. We have a certain amount of information. And if the information is given in our hands, then we have it. If it is not given in our hands, we do not have it. There are many, many things right now which we don't are unable to explain even about on this earth. So when you ask for details, the first question is not what the detail is, but have we been given information about that detail? Is there information about that detail, about how God actually created? Now here's, here's where we come to. There is a scientific explanation of how these stars and galaxies came about and it's called stellar evolution stars and galaxies it is possible that god did it that way but the first question really about that scientific uh, description is does that scientific description actually form a star or a galaxy if you use those principles that are de uh, described as scientific principles does that actually form? When you look very carefully at it, and I can quote to you uh, scientists who have tried to do it, they take all the factors and put it into a computer simulator and see if we put everything there, will it turn out to be a star? And so when you put all the theoretical points that the scientists tell us and put it into the computer, here's what they they acknowledged. In fact, these are the words, we failed miserably in trying to make even one planet, not a star. By the way, the star, the sun in our Milky Way, in our, in our solar system is the biggest of the objects. It has 94% of the mass of the entire solar system. So we're not talking about the sun, we're talking about a, a planet, which is a small bitty little part of the solar system. Even that we are unable to do. They have tried to form the moon by all the information that we have, put it into the computer and see if it forms the moon. They can't form the moon. So what does it say? It says that our information is limited. We do not know how the stars and galaxies were formed. We do not know even how the moon was formed. So to ask how they were formed and did God do this way? We don't know whether this way is the real way it occurred. So the scientific um, approach is good. And I like that. They like to find out and it's good to do that. But you cannot claim that this is the way it is and it happened without really establishing that it is the way and we have not yet established that because the computer simulations of all the theories that we have when you put it inside there cannot make even one planet cannot make the moon cannot make the stars how can it make a galaxy then so all i'm saying is we don't know how it was formed so when you describe how it is formed we have to say there are some theories out there the theories are not yet settled, so we don't know how it was formed. The biblical example is, is doesn't give any details. It just says God formed it. That's all it says. So we take it that way, and we don't look at this point to figure out about God. We do it like the pan process we did. And if the pan process showed that there is God, then we can accept maybe God did it because he is omniscient and omnipotent. So that's the way I would look at it. All right. I really appreciate how you um, base your explanations and your studies on evidence. That was that was very mind-blowing. So I think we've ran out of time. Unfortunately, there are questions coming in, but we'll send it to um, Dr. Pandit so that he will address it when there's time. Um, so I hope that everyone has been blessed by this workshop. I think I believe every one of us learned so much about how to testify the credibility of a certain religion. So praise God. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Pandit, for the workshop. 
And I would like to remind you that the next workshop from Dr. Pandit is again tomorrow at the same time, Malaysian time, 7.30 p.m. And before we dismiss, let us have a closing word of prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for using Dr. Pandit as your instrument to share with us how you are trying to testify to the world that you exist and I believe that many of us have learned so much from it and we are so blessed so please continue to speak to us Lord through Dr. Pandit your Holy Spirit and help us to sink in with all of these amazing facts that you've given to us um, I pray that you'll continue to be with us your spirit that we will continue to be blessed by this conference thank you Lord um, in Jesus name we pray and ask amen, amen. thank you Amen. So thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us in this session. I pray that you've been blessed. Um, our next workshop will be by uh, Pastor Steve Wahlberg, which will start at 9 p.m. Malaysian time. So I hope you all will have a blessed evening. See you all.